Watching Harmony and Diversity. I was speaking with Des Carl, who's a professor at Intercultural Studies at RMIT University. Thanks for coming back in again, Des. Thank you, Norm. We we were talking about uh, the well, not the plight so much, but the, the multicultural impacts, the the religious impacts, the impacts on youth, and you're do, doing quite a lot of work in relation to that. Could you could we continue on with that? Well, I, I think um, I've done a lot of work in interfaith, and that's made me think about mm -hmm. what I see as the separation of religion and state. It's usually couched in those terms. Mm -hmm. But the question I immediately ask, well, what model mm -hmm. of the separation uh, uh, is Australia following? Yes. You can sort of see an extreme version in France mm -hmm. and in the United States. Whereas Australia and Canada have followed more uh, middle of the road models of yes. the separation of religion and state. And I think also over the last 40, 45, 50 years, we've seen a repositioning of religion in um, Australia. Mm. And that's come about through that's that secularism really, its high point was from the 1870s until the 1970s, a hundred years. Right. But then I think with the solution of the state aid issue, you know, the issue about uh, giving government money to private r religious schools yeah. was a, a very major factor in that repositioning. And we've seen a greater intersection between religion and the state with the decline of the welfare state. Right. And yeah. so I think that's brought up in a new way the, the whole issue of the governance and management of religion and religious diversity. Now, I don't like calling Australia a secular society no. because the word secular has too many uh, different meanings and people understand the word in in a uh, in a certain way and yes. it differs from other people i like to say that australia is a civil society where there is a separation of religion and state mm -hmm. and that then raises the issue of what is the role of the state in the governance and management of religion and at the core of that is the role of religious law Yep. whether it's Catholic canon law or Anglican church law or Jewish law or Sharia law. And I would argue very strongly that they must always be subservient yes. to the civil and criminal law mm. uh, in a civil society. Yep. And, um, and part of that is uh, that the role of the state mm -hmm. is in in um, facilitating the observance of religious freedom yeah. and giving scope to religious groups to start up their places of worship, their schools and so on. It also has a brokering role in the sense of bringing the different faith traditions together because naturally they're in a competitive environment because the religions essentially are competing against one another yeah. because you know they believe in the centrality of their own faith and is the best faith that a person can have okay um, and, and so to bring the faith together as yeah, part so of yeah. social cohesion mm -hmm. then there's the monitoring role because there, there are there is such a thing as bad religion or bad elements in religion that can be dangerous. Yes. Um, and that's summed up in Article 18C of the International uh, Covenant on P Civil and Political Rights. And then it has a protecting role um, where um, a particular pathology 
enters into a into a particular religious tradition yeah. that places in danger um, uh, citizens of the civil society. So that that's my my yeah. take on it. But I would add to that: there's also the principle of accommodation. Mm -hmm. And I think this has been important in Australia that we've been able to accommodate certain religious and cultural practices. But there is a, a, a definite line there that you can't mm. accommodate um, particular practices yes. that are against the fundamental rights mm. of um, uh, of citizens and the example that's brought up is uh, female genital mutilation mm. although that's not an Islamic practice no. but it, because it's a practice associated with both Christian and um, Muslim societies yes. um, so uh, but we do make accommodation in um, burial customs, whether Sikhs can wear their ceremonial dagger, mm -hmm. the kirpan, or whether they can, at their own risk, wear turbans to, instead of helmets on motorbikes and so on. Yes. Um, yes. Th those accommodations we should make, um, but realising that there is also a line that cannot be crossed. Mm -hmm. That's that's a fantastic description. The civil society that it really does get over that secularity, the secular point of view. What, what, how are all? There's a lot of threads going on there. What mechanism brings those together? Is there is there a facility for overviewing how how it's going? Is it? Is there a, a yes, way of doing I, that? I um, <laughs> I I think that it would be good if in Australia. Um, there was, as there was, the Office of Multicultural Affairs attached mm. to the Prime Minister's Department yes. in the late 80s and 90s. Mm. And then it got cut out um, with the incoming of the Howard government. Mm. If that was broadened, mm. and Obama has a similar office attached mm. to the president's office okay mm. Mm. an office for multicultural and interfaith affairs right. so as to give yes. greater solidity right. to what i'm talking about yes um, and and there's also a training educational f mm. function in this with mm. religious leaders if no others for example there are many religious sorry to chop you yes off. <laughs> all right we'll be back we'll be back in a moment Welcome back. You're watching Harmony and Diversity, and we're speaking with Professor Des Carl. He's a professor of intercultural studies at RMIT University. And I was rude enough to interrupt you in the middle of your discourse <laughs> before, Jess. <laughs> And to do with education, uh, uh, education to cover all of these interfaces between mm. religion and society. How does that manifest itself? Well, the point I was making was mm. about the need to educate incoming religious leaders because yes. there are many religious leaders who come into Australia every year mm -hmm. of all faith traditions. Um, mm. and, and yet we don't have a process for doing that properly. Okay. And it, yeah. the the, uh, the particular religious tradition may do it. Or I don't think they do it properly, or uh, but there needs to be a state component to that. Mm. Um, um, so, but I, but I think more generally, I think one of the welcome developments that we've seen in Australia since um, uh, nine eleven has mm. been the development of local interfaith communities, particularly yeah. in Victoria, where there are now more than 40 of them that mm. are functioning. Yes. I would like to see a greater growth in New South Wales and in mm. other parts of Australia. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, I'm chair of Religions for Peace Australia, and mm. over the past few years, we've been able to set up um, chapters in New South Wales, Queensland, Tasmania and South Australia together mm. with Canberra and we're close to one in 
Northern Territory, unfortunately, we're finding it difficult yes. uh, in Perth. Um, mm. I think there's people there. We just haven't uh, found one who'll take the, the leadership the role, <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. run it. Yes. Um, but uh, I think th this has been very important because they've tended to happen in um, religiously very diverse communities. Yes. And I think it's brought about in a particular way to dis demystify the other. Yeah. Okay? Mm. That through meeting a Muslim, through meeting a Buddhist, through meeting a Excellent. Jain or a Baha'i, member of the Baha'i faith, yes. that 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 person that religious tradition is now demystified. Yes. A and I think that's a very important factor because let's be honest, if Australia did have a provocative attack, mm. terrorist attack. Mm. then our community relations would be strained yes. depending on what happened. Mm. And I've, I've always felt that we had 9-11 and then we had the two Bali bombings. Mm. And I think the Australian community realised that we were now in new territory. Yes. And yes, it's become polarised with the Islamophobia and so on, and that's true. But I think that's also been balanced by um, the rise of the interfaith movement. And Prime Ministers now talk about multi-faith Australia in the last four or five years in a way that it would not have, cr that phrase would not have crossed their lips no. before that. Um, mm. So I think there is that realisation. And I think that, that politicians realise the importance of the interfaith multicultural movement yes. in a way, for example, that businessmen don't. Mm. But I just wish that politicians mm. would give more um, funding to the interfaith movement yes. because it basically is now based on volunteerism. And, yeah. um, but that may have to change. That the, the, the whole thing about Islamophobia, etc has been done through the security framework, okay, yeah. border security, internal security, and the interfaith component of, the, of that has not been sufficiently emphasised. Right. And the emphasis has been on the technology and, and all that instead of. Because if we were to be put under pressure, um, it will be these bonds mm. at the community level which will help us through su such an event if such an event should happen. Yes. Because there inevitably would be a backlash. Certainly would. And, and I think you know, this whole issue of uh, Islamophobia, uh, it's not that long ago, and even today you'll strike it in talking with people, mm. even amongst Christians. There's mm. what you might call Catholicophobia, yes. or et cetera, which grows out of mm. ignorance. Mm. And so the ho whole issue with the interfaith uh, for you is that's a, an education process mm. which needs to have substantial support so mm. as you can go mm. out further than just volunteerism. Yeah. Yeah. It's a so community building mm. venture, really, mm. um, in an ever complex society. Right. But Islamophobia, um, I mean, we have to support the, the religious centre, mm. okay? Mm. Because there are extremists in most most faiths. It yes. depends what they're extreme on. That's right. um, but I think that the centre must hold and we must support religious moderation. Mm. Um, I, I, I can't emphasise that enough. Mm. Well, w with your experience of, of these interfaith movements, what's your impression of the people who attend those, who are obviously, they're, they're, they're basically preaching to the converted, but there, there are religious leaders from the various faiths who attend them. What's your experience of their capacity to, to speak eye to eye? Yeah, I'm a believer in, even though it might be, as you say, speaking to the converted, but I think there's also an osmosis process that mm. extends out into the community. Mm. But here I have to be critical of the role of the media. Mm. Mm. Now, in March, 
I organised, we organised Religions for Peace Australia for the Grand Mufti of Australia mm. to give a speech in Parliament House. Mm. He gave a wonderful speech. He's a poet. Not one single press report. <laughs> yes, and recently, yes, about two or three weeks ago, he gave yes. a, a mm. statement on, uh, to his own youth on de-radicalisation. Nothing, Nothing in the press. No. But equally, if there'd been any suggestion of bombings or anything uh, gross like that, the press would have been all over it. Of course, yes. And we're out of time, so we'll be back to that point. Thanks very much, Des. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. You're watching Harmony and Diversity. We're speaking with Des Carl. He's a professor of intercultural studies at the RMIT University. Des, we were talking about education and talking about the civil society. Uh, an important part in this, of course, is because when the conflicts arise, when there's issues, the police are involved. What's happening with the education of the police? Well, I'm a member of the um Victoria Police Multi-Faith Council mm -hmm. and that's an advisory body to the police which was formed in 2005 mm -hmm. and, and they previously had had a multicultural advisory group but then they realised that they needed this. Now this in some ways is a world first. All right. I, mm. I think it's, that needs to be said. Mm. Um, and so that body has continued uh, since then. Mm. Um, and so we obviously are briefed by the police on various um, issues, uh, mm. such as the Bendigo Mosque issue, yeah. um, domestic violence and the rise in domestic violence cases and the role of the police and the role of religion mm -hmm. in countering domestic violence and so on. Okay. So, th you know, the, it, it can play a quite important role and the, the police do take it seriously and it's led to things like the police force each year holding an iftar dinner during Ramadan for mm -hmm. police at various levels, right mm -hmm. down to the local station, yes. um, uh, to dine together uh, with members of the Muslim community. There's also a Jewish police dinner, yes. okay, for building up relationships between the police and members of the Jewish community. So I think these have been Im important initiatives. Mm. Um, and I, I think in, in the Bendigo Mosque issue, the police were very aware of that from day one. In fact, they were aware um, through their own intelligence mm. with right-wing extremist groups who were stirring up hatred against Muslims. So they were aware of that and they became conscious that certain of these organizations were focusing on Bendigo. They also had their eyes on two other Australian regional cities in New South Wales, mm. uh, but, the, the one, but that hasn't received the publicity that has happened in Bendigo. Mm. And, um, and, and so we on the council were uh, concerned that within Bendigo there had not been established a Bendigo Interfaith Council. Right. So through our own contacts within the churches, we I think pushed Bendigo to um, go forward and yeah. a few months ago they had the inaugural dinner of the Bendigo Interfaith Council um, to which as a person born in Bendigo yes, I was invited <laughs> to be the, the keynote speaker yes. a and, and I mean, Bendigo is an interesting city because mm. it, it's had this controversy with the mosque. Mm. It also has the wonderful K 
Catholic cathedral, mm -hmm. uh, neo-Gothic cathedral, and then also yeah. the the refurbished Anglican cathedral, which I think is now open again. Mm -hmm. But it then has the um, stupa, the Buddha stupa, being built outside Bendigo, which is the mm -hmm. said to be the largest in the Western world. Oh, really? Uh, mm. And, and it, mm. it, it, so Bendigo is becoming a very interesting Australia's leading regional centre for religion and culture um, with these uh, quite fascinating developments. But I think that was an example, the, the, the point I want to come back to, mm. of the police working with right. uh, members of the interfaith communities representing their different traditions mm. and achieving something worthwhile. Mm. Yeah, it's fairly, fairly powerful because those situations are very touchy. They could go the wrong way very easily. Mm. Uh, how much of the the work that this council does is to do with actually educating individual police about the various faiths, what they look like? Is there sort of a, a general awareness of that created? Well, there is. Um, mm. A few years ago, we did look at the basic training that's given mm. um, to uh, police trainees out there at Glen Waverley. Mm. We had a look at what they do. We made some recommendations. Mm. But, you know, that's basic training um, mm. for, uh, you know, members of the police force. Mm. They're learning a lot in a short amount of time. Yes. So it does have to be reinforced. But the police have a system of um, multicultural, multi-faith liaison officers in each of the regions yeah. and their their work is supposed to be trying to educate other police or perhaps educate might be too strong a word but to make them aware of the issues um, mm. and, and I think this has been a useful thing. How well it operates I think it still needs to be evaluated mm. but other states, mm. New South Wales, which, you know, obviously has problems mm. in this area, is, mm. I hear, setting up a similar kind of body to, mm. um, to liaise with the New South Wales police. So, so Vic Victoria, why, why do you think Victoria is, sort of seems to be ahead of the game a bit there? And in fact, as you said, ahead of the world in some ways. Well, I think um, the multicultural movement mm. was initially centred in, I think, Victoria and to a lesser extent South Australia. Yeah. Uh, New South Wales was there too. I don't want to downgrade their importance, but mm. Um, mm. I mean, the history of Australia, Melbourne has tended to be um, the origin of many social movements yeah. throughout Australian history, and I think that's true right. here too. It, was, it also had the World Parliament of Religions here. That, that had a big impact, didn't it? It did have yes. a big yes. impact, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, there have been some flow-on effects, not as many as I would like to have seen, mm -hmm. but I think it was important mm -hmm. um, to have been held here in Melbourne. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the committee that, that awarded the Parliament mm -hmm to Melbourne I was very impressed by the police mm. multi-faith council. Well, and I think they should be impressed and I think uh, the people who watch this program should be impressed mm. by the the description that you've provided to us, Des. Thank you so much for coming and uh, maybe sometime later we might be able to, to speak again. Thank you, Norm. Thanks very much. You've been watching Harmony and Diversity. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Baha